So I very much welcome you here today. I mean, I know it's a beautiful November day. I was thinking I'd be talking to myself today, so I'm super pleased to see you all. And I was asked to talk about Herculaneum, and I thought, oh, let me go online and see what's up with Herculaneum. Of course, I realized the first thing that pops up is Herculaneum, Missouri. <laughs> and by the way, there is a Pompeii, Michigan as well. Okay? However, their website was not as good as the one on Herculaneum. It's a small town. But I do have, of course, more serious things to talk about today in terms of Herculaneum. And my hope is that I can present the work of many, many excellent scholars who have done an immense amount of work basically on the skeletal collections especially that have come from Herculaneum. So this is my amalgam of all of their information and hopefully I will do it at least a bit of justice. I uh, was challenged actually in getting to the heart of the topic of the talk today because of course the studies at Herculaneum are indeed a work in progress. They uh, have excavated at this point in time at about 350 skeletons or so. They continue on working and doing parts of the collection. So my hope is that I'll be asked back in about a year and probably can fill you in in even greater detail with the new and future developments at Herculaneum. So I'm standing on the heels of many excellent scholars who have worked at this site. Uh, probably the first one of which I should mention, and I almost dedicate the lecture to her, is an unsung hero in a sense of the life of people at Herculaneum, a woman by the name of Sarah Bissell, and she died an untimely death. And when I looked her up on the website, actually, before I came on over, I found that she had committed suicide, actually. And that uh, really sort of put a spike in my heart, and I thought, well, let me just talk about her, at least in a little bit of detail. Because as all pioneers, her work was very important in establishing the, the real core, essentially, of this kind of work at Herculaneum. And she was responsible in the 1980s, actually, for uh, the excavation of the probably about 80 of the skeletons from Herculaneum, which she published through the 90s and her untimely death in 1996 actually stops basically her generation of work on this important and very amazing site. So anyway, let me launch into it and please, I hope that at the end I can leave some moments and you can all pipe up and ask me some very good questions and I'll hopefully be able to address at least some of them. Again, I say that the work is based on many people and there's many great works which actually have been written about the site. So most of the time when we're thinking about that part of the world in the Bay of Naples and we're talking about catastrophe, we're oftentimes referencing the information which comes from the, probably the sort of the higher profile site of Pompeii. And indeed, as Dr. Sigurds had just mentioned, in the basically 300 years since it was sort of rediscovered, they have actually removed probably something on the order of about 1,100 skeletons or so, so quite a dollop of skeletal materials. At Herculaneum, the challenges are a bit greater in the sense that um, the uh, overbearing of this volcanic material in Herculaneum is much deeper. So excavations at that site, actually although delayed, probably that's a good thing because many of the skeletons at Pompeii were disorganized because of their early find. Herculaneum delayed okay, and actually bringing forth a lot of the skeletal materials, but of course brought that into the 20th and 21st century at a time when we were more able really basically to handle that kind of material. So at the present time, there's somewhere between about 300 and 350 skeletons that I'm actually going to talk with you about today and tell you the results of the work which has been going on for approximately 30 years on these materials. The inset on the side is actually um, uh, a skeleton excavated by uh, Sarah Bissell. She was oftentimes critiqued in her work with National Geographic for being a kind of a flashy person and presenting her information. And this woman was the one which was dubbed the ring lady because, of course, on the ends of her uh, crunched in fingers, her hyperflex fingers, because, of course, I'll explain what that means in a minute, she actually has two brilliant rings, okay, as well as bracelets which lie close okay, to the area which would have been associated with her body. Um, the skeletons were 
nicely excavated. For those of you who haven't been at an archaeological excavation with skeletons, you probably don't know that when an archaeologist comes upon skeletons, they basically swoon. You think they're going to die. Okay? You think that they want to run away, flee from the site forever. Because the prospect of excavating a skeleton in an archaeological site is quite labor intensive. Okay? So each skeleton can take a person one or two days, depending on the context they're re removing it from. And in the case of Herculaneum, it's from rock hard tephra, which represents the ejection of the local volcano Vesuvius. Okay. The town itself is also very interesting because it really was completely built upon okay, by the later iterations essentially of the town. And because of that, it protected the town, but also too made it quite a challenge in the actual exposure of the individual units of the site and therefore of the excavation of the skeletal materials. The area today actually is overlain okay, with a town called Herculano, which is a sort of a modern version of the word Herculaneum. The original name of the town was Racina, named after a sanctuary, a local sanctuary in the region. Many people consider it to be really a suburb of Naples. To give you a sense of the density of population in this area, in the vicinity of Vesuvius, there lives okay, approximately half of a million people. So if there's another event of Vesuvius, of course, it's going to affect those populations in quite dramatic ways. The last eruption of Vesuvius was in 1944, and that's actually been well documented, and I have actually the link in the slide set here of the YouTube video of a documentary which was made at the time to show the actual eruption and also to talk about its effects on local farmers and on villagers. In any event, the site itself okay, probably in its exposed area has been in its extent somewhat delineated, but they also know that much of the town underlies okay, many, many meters of sediments under Ercolano. So we can look forward to maybe a hundred more years of wonderful discoveries at the site. Just to give you a visual sense of this, uh, actually, the slide is not projecting usually well. Actually, they're kind of out of focus a little bit. I apologize on that. I think they look like they're in focus on here. But the extent of it okay, basically is ringed, okay, is depressed vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the town. These varied views kind of give you a sense of what that's like. Here is the built-up town of Ercolanium, and then you can see the depressed center okay, right here, which is actually this uh, associated ruins okay, of this ancient town of Herculaneum. The volcanic eruption, of course, that we're talking about is Vesuvius. It happened in AD 19, uh, AD 1979, oh my God, in AD 19, uh, no, God, AD 79, uh, when I tried to really kind of uh, sort of drill down and find out more about the exact date, I was wondering at the time when I began the research, how did they know that it was the, you know, the equivalent of 24 August? And as it turns out, there's actually a lot of controversy about that. They think that the date was actually associated with the bombing by the Allies of Naples okay, on August the 24th in 1943. Okay, so they came to associate it with the eruption. But indeed, based on coins and things like this, which have been found at the site uh, of Herculaneum, they think that probably the time frame in which we're looking at, the date that we're looking at, is probably something actually mid-November or so. And that's not an idle statement that I make. I make the statement because this town, Herculaneum, as well as Pompeii, were considered to be resort places for the rich and wealthy of, of Rome, that they came there basically and hung out on the shores of the... Uh, Mediterranean in the Bay of Naples during those nice long hot lingering months of the summer but of course that would have extended on into August and I do tell a bit of a sort of a background sort of a little bit of a, a little sort of vignette of myself uh, my family is actually from the Bay of Naples and that's why I'm super pleased actually to be here my family my family home is in Ischia so in the 1950s I actually began as a little child going to Pompeii, and I have family photographs of me and my family actually going through Pompeii on horse-drawn carriages, no less. Okay. So there you go. I look for these in my sort of my family photo mass, and um, 
wasn't able to locate them. I didn't have enough time to really devote to it. But basically, it is indeed, okay, it was at that time quite a resort area. So when they talk about this, and they talk about it in terms of the skeletal materials, they're looking basically for class differences, basically, in the skeletal material as a way of reconstructing life from these very uh, just bare bones, which is what they've actually been able to extract. Okay? And that particular kind of time frame really does dictate the way you interpret a lot of the skeletal materials. Okay? So rather than being in the summer, it appears to be very, very, very far in the fall, pretty close to today's date, actually, which I think is also kind of cool. The original excavations were actually sponsored by National Geographic. And National Geographic, being National Geographic, constructed some absolutely amazing maps, okay, basically, as well as other illustrations to accompany their two articles. One appeared in 1982 and one appeared in 1984. And this one I actually find especially sort of beautiful. It actually is showing you Vesuvius. It's also making a reference to the modern town of Herculaneum. It also shows the position of Pompeii. And their position vis-a-vis -vis the mountain itself, the volcano itself, is very much instrumental in us understanding the differences between the two towns when it comes to the extraction of information coming from the skeletal material. So the next slide is actually showing you an eruptive volcano. This one is not Vesuvius. Obviously, this is a volcano which recently erupted in the Philippines. Actually, I think it was in 1984. And it's actually showing you this combination of gas and debris that's part of the eruptive sequence. Oftentimes, the volcanoes, although they all, of course, take a somewhat different cast, the eruptive sequence of a volcano. And then, of course, at um, Herculaneum, Pompeii as well, we're looking at this first kind of air mass sort of um, dust fall, okay, followed by a series of pyroclastic, what are called density currents. In the case of the particular events on Vesuvius, the currents are actually called surges, which carry gas and debris, which manage to cover the whole town and its inhabitants, and killing, of course, many of them. In terms of volcanic events, okay, Vesuvius ranks among the very highest in terms of fatalities. Although, in terms of the great disasters of the planet, generally volcanoes do not measure up to some of the sort of the world's great disasters which have occurred, natural disasters which have occurred. Mostly they are associated with various things associated with flood and floodwaters and earthquakes, which have a much broader kind of an effect. In the case of volcanoes, their effects have a tendency to be somewhat more localized. Okay. One of the big ones, which is super well documented, which I use in many of my classes as a model of understanding volcanic eruptions is Krakatoa in Indonesia. And there is much information which has been written about this. And of course, in the slide coming up next, I'm going to show you what's called the son of Krakatoa. And you'll see, actually, uh, Anak Krakatoa, which is building at a dramatic rate, which is actually located at the junction of three crustal plates, which of course is driving okay, this in almost a, um, a manic kind of surge okay, of this volcano. So volcanic events okay, basically do damage, they do damage to human life. And I'm going to do some comparisons actually to the cause of death which affected victims of the explosion of Mount St. Helens because we've got some good information on that. I also do a bit of a comparison always in forensics, okay, because of course, as uh, Dr. Siggers had mentioned, I do do much work in forensics, and I'm very interested in burning and things like this associated with skeletal materials. I mostly work with children, so I'll do a, a little bit of a comparison on that score to give you a feel for what it would have been like to be associated with this event. Okay. So the next okay, is, as I promised, okay, Anak Krakatoa. This is this developing volcano in Indonesia, and I've been told, okay, that you can actually take tours there and climb up, okay, to the summit if you'd so like to do so. I think that would scare the pants off of me, but if you would so like to do so, you could take a little trek, okay, and see what's up, okay. Uh, it is actually Krakatoa in terms of recorded volcanoes, probably the best of these. Actually, that and the volcanic eruption that happened right prior to that also in Indonesia 
uh, change climatic patterns okay, all over the globe for the course of at least two years, and this has been well documented. And uh, they actually call that first eruptive event in Indonesia the year that had no summer. Okay? Actually, the, uh, the dust particles in the air reduced the amount of radiation going to the Earth's surface in such a way that it was snowing in Europe okay, in the summertime, and there was actually no growing season in the temperate zones on the planet. That's how immense okay, that eruption pattern was okay, and all volcanic eruptions do do okay this kind of global uh, 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 amount of climate change, as did Mount St. Helens, which altered the course of the sequence of weather in, um, uh, especially in North America, for the better part of a of a year. In any event, okay, we can look at this area, and like all of these areas that have volcanoes, who could be in Indonesia, could be anywhere on the on the west coast of South America. These areas are associated with a great deal of geologic instability. And I mention this because the thinking is that the composition of the towns of Pompeii and Herculaneum in 79, when the volcano erupted, was probably very altered, okay, based on a huge earthquake that hit the area and actually in 62 AD. So the thinking is that its function as the sort of uh, summer resort kind of villa place was probably altered well before the eruption of Vesuvius. Thus, the interpretation of the skeletal materials are affected by a bit of a longer term, going back at least to the time of this earthquake. As I had mentioned before, the Earth, this volcano Vesuvius, has been active for a long time. I'm actually going to show you a slide with its varied uh, known dates of eruption or, or years of eruption. The one in 1944 is especially interesting to me because, of course, it's so well recorded photographically. It also is a, a video, okay? And that, of course, represents the beginnings of that kind of technology, which can bring this sort of very real okay, into the world at the time and very real into the future. Uh, looking at that volcanic event okay, in 1944 is astounding. And this particular photograph was taken by a U.S. Um, Air Force pilot okay, who was flying in the area at the time of its eruption. Of course, the further you go back, the renditions take on a historic cast and, of course, are viewed in a variety of different kinds of uh, media. This one actually happens to be uh, a, an oil painting, essentially, of the eruption. Uh, uh, Vesuvius okay, actually is uh, in eruptive phases okay, many times in its recent history. Actually, in fact, the, I really like looking at this little sort of from the top view of the volcano because, of course, this lip okay, or rim represents the original okay, formation of Vesuvius okay, before it essentially blew okay, in 79. And this is the formative sequence of the new version of the volcano. And of course, it is considered to be a silent one at the moment, but indeed one that's quite likely to become activated again. It's also a volcano that has been associated with lots of different kinds of eruptions, including lava flows. Okay. So often uh, volcanoes have a particular kind of a pattern associated with their eruption. In the case of Vesuvius, it really has pretty much done everything that a volcano can do. So it's always full of surprises. Okay. It's these pyroclastic surges okay, that are probably responsible for the bulk of the deaths okay, that we see at Herculaneum and at uh, um, uh, Pompeii. These uh, surges okay, basically are a mixture, essentially, of gas and of debris. Depending on, um, basically, the mixture of gas and debris, okay, they can actually flow or fall okay, at particular rates and move over particular contours of the Earth. Because of this combination of gas, which is basically heavier than oxygen, the gas and the debris can actually change form okay, as it moves okay, along the Earth's surface. It can flow under and on top of water, so, you know, in a sense, really nothing is really safe from this. The reconstruction, which was done uh, by National Geographic on Pompeii, basically shows okay, what this would have looked like in the distance from a town like Pompeii. And it is always of interest to us to try to determine 
whether or not the people in Herculaneum and Pompeii were aware of the fact okay, that this was about to erupt and, and basically if they understood what volcanic eruption actually meant. Okay. Uh, so, you know, basically if we were in the world today and we basically were sitting beside an active volcano, assuming that it, you know, just didn't explode one day but was going through a series of eruptive changes, we would recognize the fact that we had to get out of there, get out of town, okay? But we're not so sure, okay, that the people of Herculaneum and Pompeii would have had that same kind of impetus, okay, to really think about it in terms of its uh, uh, immense effects, okay, on the regional populations. Uh, again, it's one of these things where it's hard for us to translate sort of a modern mindset going back in the world. As with all of these things, because of course my whole life is reconstructing life in the past, it's very hard not to project okay, your background, your knowledge okay, to these things that have happened in this um, deep time. Okay. In terms of Herculaneum and Pompeii, the effect of the volcano was actually quite different. This had to do with these surges, <clears throat> depending on uh, who you read, there were several of these surges. It probably depends on what part of the town you're in or if you're outside of town. And of course, the issues are there are skeletal materials that came from people outside of town, and all these issues are cool too. But basically, in this sequence of surges, you have at Pompeii the development of quite a, um, a, a depth okay, of volcanic material that really outstrips the kind of depth that you see of volcanic material in Pompeii, which of course then, as I said before, leaves Pompeii basically open to uh, earlier um, knowledge okay, of the city and also to an earlier looting basically of the city than it does Herculaneum, but it also makes Pompeii a much more easy site to actually excavate versus Herculaneum, where in the literature you hear over and over and over again, excavations have been erratic okay, in terms of the time frame in which it has been found. And it really is indeed based on funding levels and things like that, which really do create the scenario in which uh, less is known about Herculaneum than is known about Pompeii. Uh, just to give you a, another kind of a sense on this, Holy smokes, I'm, it's really, really blurry. Can you see it at all, or is it just me who thinks it's blurry? Is it okay? Yeah, what can we do? Okay. <laughs> the um, uh, sediments okay, at Herculaneum okay, are said to be something on the order of about 20 meters or so, whereas you can see the sediments go to about 5 meters or so at the town of Pompeii. In terms of the temperature which would have been involved with these surges, okay, we're looking at Pompeii at something on the order of about 300 degrees centigrade, and at Herculaneum, closer to 400. Some people actually put it closer to 500 degrees centigrade. This is actually called a cold or a dilute pyroclastic flow. So by temperature, this is actually cool okay, in some of these flows, other flows that have been recorded. The movement of the flow can be anywhere from 100 to about 400 meters per second. So you're talking almost no ability to have a reaction time once the flow has kind of come upon you. In Pompeii, okay, the skeletal materials, these 1,100 individuals, because they were found early on and over a long period of time, and because the situation was such that there was no museum facility to store them, the storage of the Pompeii material has led to the further degradation of the sample and to the further inability of bioarchaeologists to really kind of reconstruct life in Pompeii. So this is actually showing you um, Estelle Lazen. Okay. She is the person who actually did probably the most summative work of the skeletal materials from Pompeii, an amazing work okay, in all of its many facets, including its... Uh, uh, comparisons to Herculaneum. Uh, she's sitting in a, in a room, basically, where you see skulls that are all situated here, long bones in a bin all situated here. So the skeletal collections were actually sorted by element. Okay? So rather than having skeletal people, okay, they had skeletal elements. And although you can get certain things, like you know, basically a uh, minimum number of individuals, 
you can get probably a general distribution of sex and age and things like this. For certain kinds of analyses, as for example, ones that are associated with health and disease, you generally need a kind of a, a whole individual, a whole skeleton, okay, to do those sorts of studies. So she was working with a very difficult collection, and I very much admire her work, okay, not only in its complexity and in its um, uh, really kind of its clarity having to do with these materials, but actually just in the action of being able to extract okay, information from a collection that would have been very, very difficult to work from. Whenever I look at this and I worry about our skeletal collections here at the museum, I always say, oh, we are in such good shape in comparison to, <laughs> to so many places in the world. In fact, our skeletal collections are in excellent condition because of reasonably good okay, um, a storage area through the long devoted efforts of Dr. Uh, Sigurds, for example. We've been able to really ensure that the collections will move on to, into the future in, a, in the same state that they are at the present time. And hopefully nothing like this will ever happen again. And of course, we can't go back 300 years and redo it, so we just really basically have to live with it this way and see what we can get. Okay. And here's the second view of her in, a, in, in, in the same area, but just to give you the enormity, essentially, of the piles of these bones sort of all sitting together. So, um, I mean, obviously, not only are they separated by skeletal element, but you can see they're just sort of, you know, thrown about. And, of course, the breakage and things like this is going to be enormous in terms of that collection. Of course, many of you know, and very important in terms of the reconstruction of life in Pompeii, are these casts, okay, which have been made uh, basically because this pyroclastic material, when it cooled, okay, formed a rock-hard material, and when it cooled with the people on the inside, okay, obviously they decomposed within the caverns or crevices, okay, which were formed around their body during cooling. But also, too, part of their shape okay, or cast okay, was actually also, too, embedded okay, in the cooled volcanic material. So in order to preserve that, uh, they actually went about the process of the identification of places, the cavernous places okay, within the deposits in Pompeii, filled them with plaster, and of course they then in that plaster amalgamated really all of the individual skeletal elements and everything else that was part of the skeleton. But they also too gave us kind of um, a face essentially to those individuals. And in some cases, the faces are quite uh, complete and actually easy to see sort of the details of the faces. I'll show you one of those in a second. So these castings, okay, which are constantly actually being um, uh, uh, replastered, okay, are indeed holding skeletal materials. And of course, then it becomes the issue of whether or not it's more important to get to the skeletons or to leave the castings. And um, at the moment, okay, of course, the idea is that we could perhaps image the internal skeletal elements and anything else that's inside of them, but to leave the castings in place because, of course, what they record in terms of the people's body form, their facial expressions, and things of this nature. Okay, the next one is showing you an especially detailed, okay face impression which was left in this volcanic material. So they do serve a very important function. The next slide actually, and, I, and you don't see it as often as uh, I might like it, you can see that the plaster casting has actually not completely covered the skull. So some people think that they're just impressions on the inside of these natural cavities, but indeed they are on the inside holding uh, this uh, skeletal material. And one of my students told me a great story, and I, I borrowed this slide from her. She said that in the year that she had worked at Pompeii, they had decided to fill these natural casting places, not with plaster, which of course you can't see through, but with a transparent epoxy. Okay? And so, of course, then, then they poured the transparent epoxy okay, into the crevasse. Okay? It reacted probably with some of the materials inside of the 
dried volcanic material, and it turned kind of a yellow, almost sort of a creamy kind of a color. So she referred to um, them as the snot people, <laughs> like basically, like, and of course you could see the skeleton on the inside, but you're going like, nah, <laughs> like I don't think I want to look at this. <laughs> in terms of the cause of death and things of this nature, we're going to approach that in a minute or two, but I wanted to give you a sense of what the skeletal materials actually looked like when they were exposed at Herculaneum. And uh, really, and, and it's almost the, oh my goodness, or the gee wow kind of a moment associated with this. And so, of course, in one of the, um, and uh, I'll, I'll explain in more detail too, the skeletal material at Herculaneum was found primarily in boathouses, okay, and on the adjacent beach to the boathouses, okay. So in opening up one of the boathouses, and removing some of the overburden of volcanic material, they came down upon basically this mass okay, of individuals kind of intertwined, okay, individuals that were present in one of the storage boat units okay, at Herculaneum. And looking at this, of course, I do think you get the impression of how difficult it would be to excavate that out, okay, of this kind of accreted material. Uh, also, too, okay, just to give you a sense of what some of the skeletons look like, I actually illustrate one up here in the top right-hand corner because when we go through and we talk about this in more detail, I think that you're going to be not only interested kind of in the skeletons, mostly when we're doing skeletons archaeologically, they're in cemeteries, they're in extended positions or flex positions, things like this. But the skeletons here, of course, as a sort of slice of life, are in different kinds of positions, okay? And the positions that they're in are positively scary in some cases, okay? You know, like lying with the arms out, like clenching, basically. It looks like clenching the dirt, okay? In this particular case, the individual skeletons are actually in a hyper kind of a flex position. It actually is associated with a particular kind of a pattern associated perhaps with thermal shock. Okay. So it looks like they're protecting themselves or they're cowering or something like that in some way. Chances are that's not a good way of thinking about them. These are actually representing the effects, okay, basically of that super hot gas and debris. Okay hitting the people. In some cases, we're actually looking at buildings falling upon them based on the overburden of debris, which is falling down on the roofs and things of this nature. In the case of the boathouses, the thinking is that there was a huge thermal surge of this pyroclastic material through the openings of the boathouses themselves. And this, of course, you know, sort of probably through, okay, some of the people seeking shelter there, okay, into a, a ball together towards the back of these enclosures, leading to ultimately the preservation, but ultimately to the exposure of the skeletal materials in a, in a frame like this, okay. So it looks kind of scary, okay. And it may be, and I try to figure this out too, because of that sort of fury kind of a look that they have about them, whether or not death was long-term, it was very quick or whatever, for the most measure, the thinking is that death was indeed quite quick. Okay? So these aren't people who are cringing or protecting themselves. Okay? These are people who are basically there and then dead, basically. Sometimes they, some perhaps by thermal shock, some through asphyxiation. So maybe it was a few moments, but it was a very quick um, slice in time. There's various reconstructions of what would have happened as this material fell onto the structures, which are part of Herculaneum. So this overburden would have cracked through, okay, the supports of the ceiling, eventually collapsing many of the structures into the internal cavities, okay, of the, of the uh, houses or other kinds of enclosures. That first okay, kind of uh, swoop, okay, of this volcanic material in the form of ash, okay, would have, of course, killed many individuals, okay. but these flows or surges later on would have had an effect okay, of a different order, okay, a second order, okay, of group of death of changes okay, at the site. So there's Sarah Bissell. Okay. She's actually cleaning some of the skeletal materials. 
And uh, she, as I had said before, really was called upon in 1982 to begin the excavation of these remains in the boathouse, and, and eventually they found more on the beach because it was thought initially that no one died in Herculaneum, okay? That they had a fair warning and had all left town. And indeed, many individuals may have left town, but these individuals did remain behind. It was just a matter of getting through the mass of overburden and down to them uh, that really kind of took the time and the effort. Okay, so she was called in to do this work. Okay. She indeed did find, she did excavate out in the 80s uh, most of the material from the boathouse. Okay. A lot of this, as I had said, was published by National Geographic and then eventually for her a series of professional publications. Okay. Um, this is actually a view of the excavation of one of the skeletons when I talked about it as being really time intensive. I think you get a sense of what I mean here. I also really like this view because you can see, okay, the, uh, you can see the skeleton articulated, okay, basically emerging from those sediments, okay, as the archaeologist takes more and more and more of the overburden away, okay, and then eventually pedestals each one of the individual bones, okay, photographs it, and then, of course, removes it from contacts, okay. So this is as the person basically died in position. Again, something that we don't really uh, almost ever get, okay. Uh, what are these boathouses like and what are the beaches like? Well, of course, as with all of these things having to do with uh, the edges of um, our beaches of continents, they change in um, height. Okay? So at the time of Herculaneum, basically the beach okay, was really basically exposing a whole area that um, was, was actively used. Uh, the, of course, the beach level or the water level is quite different today. It's further away from this area, so the excavation now is basically inland and, of course, under part of the city of Herculaneum. I mean, sorry, Her Herculano. Here are the various openings that the boats were stored and then the people on the beach. There are, I there are interesting questions. The next one also, too. You can see what these openings look like. They took refuge in there, okay? So there are various okay, interpretations as to when in these sequences the peoples on the beach died and when the people in the houses, the boat houses actually died. These are super good questions. I mean, were they, uh, after the first eruptive phases, did they run into the boat houses? Don't know, okay, actually. We do know that the people on the beaches, okay, are actually dead on top, okay, of the first debris, which actually blew out of the volcano. So they survived that and looked like they were running towards the ocean, something like that, really, to escape from these uh, secondary, but nevertheless super powerful and deadly eruptive sequences, okay. So uh, to go there today, and I have actually not been in Herculaneum, I've been in Pompeii, you of course are looking down into this ancient town. So that must be a, a really interesting kind of an effect, okay, to see this like this, okay. Uh, we also too know that at Herculaneum, unlike at Pompeii, we have the preservation of lots of different kinds of materials, okay. Wood has been preserved, and actually parts of the hulls of boats have been preserved in the boathouses. So you can see that there are discussions, you know, basically I think as you could uh, just feel, okay, there are discussions as to what kind of temperature, okay, these surges actually were under because, of course, they didn't incinerate, okay, a lot of these other organic materials, not that they wouldn't have been deadly to a human, but the incineration capability was uh, more limited. That's why they think, you know, probably the temperature is a little bit lower, okay, than, um, what uh, sometimes it is reconstructed as being, okay? Uh, nice reconstructions done. This one I especially like, okay, because, of course, it shows, okay, this first gas, okay, a uh, uh, blast, okay, associated with uh, the beginning phases of the eruptive cycle. You can see that people would have been trapped in this. They think that people, okay, in that first cycle, okay, where you basically have plumes of ash and gas, okay, at rapid speed coming down, okay, on the inhabitants of the town, the thinking is that the bulk of people under those conditions died probably of falling debris, 
okay, more than anything else. Because depending on the um, uh, speed and intensity, okay, of this blast, okay, it would have carried with it a lot of material, obviously, from the volcano, but also, too, would have dislodged all kinds of materials, okay, from the town and also, too, from the local sort of seaside and also, too, from the woods and things like that and the farmhouses. In any event, okay, it must have been quite a devastating thing. There is not a lot of evidence that supports this because, in other words, there are not a lot of what we call perimortal fractures, okay, that are found at the site. So, indeed, you know, basically if they were uh, killed by falling debris, it would have been things that were primarily injuring soft tissue because the bone material itself doesn't, you know, look unusually sort of broken up as you would expect from a series of, um, just at the time of death, what we call perimortem fractures. Okay. Um, in any event, okay, causes of death have been much speculated upon, and the great comparisons, at least in my opinion, are to the eruption and the dead <clears throat> of Mount St. Helens in 1980, many of whom, I think actually all of whom were autopsied. There were 67 known victims, okay, 27 of the, of the 67 known victims Five died of thermal shock. This is basically where the superheated air hitting the body just basically stops. They actually, you know, they, they basically say evaporates, okay, essentially organ mass, okay, that there is, it's basically an instantaneous death. The rest of them died through asphyxiation, and they reckon this uh, through soft tissue analysis that we couldn't tell on a skeleton, and that has to do with mucus plugs in the nose and in the throat, okay, associated with asphyxi asphyxiation, okay. The rest of the individuals, they actually made the determination were actually superheated, baked, basically, okay, within um, what's called the pyroclastic density current, okay, that's the, in our case, the density current is referred to at Herculaneum as a surge, okay, but in that mass okay, of material, and so they basically were cooked, okay, uh, hopefully quickly, not too painfully, but cooked nevertheless. Okay. So they think that fuminate, fuminating shock, or okay, sometimes what's called traumatic shock, okay, occurs at temperatures of about 500 degrees uh, uh, Celsius, okay. They could have also asphyxiated okay, from the high temperatures, but also primarily from the severe particle pollution, which would have been present. There are some skeletons that show perimortem damage okay, associated with flying projectiles, but there's not a huge number of them. Okay. In terms of the positions of their body, as promised, I'll make a bit of a mention of this here. Okay. So uh, uh, basically, okay, and what frequently happens okay, in death, okay, is that there is a contraction of the muscles of the body. Generally speaking, the stronger muscles in that contraction will um, uh, position the body in a particular way. This is called the pugilistic pose, okay, because, of course, the flexors, especially in the hands, the shoulders, and arms, will draw them in in a position that looks like a person who's about to go in a boxing ring. Okay. Uh, generally speaking, you don't see that kind of an action when you're looking at a recently dead person because, of course, uh, within just a bit of time, most of that effect okay, that occurs in the musculature dissipates and it goes back to a relaxed kind of a sequence or place. The second kind of, um, of um, presentation okay, is in a, a cadaver spasm. Okay? And this is total muscle contraction. They think it's a complete breakdown of musculature. And the whole body is kind of hunched over, okay? And oftentimes at Herculaneum and in Pompeii, it looks like okay, they're in a position pushing their body up off the ground, which has been described many times as being an attempt to cover the face, okay? But chances are they're actually going into this particular kind of spasm, okay? especially the ones that would have landed on their face if they were blown there from these blasts. And then, of course, as they crunch inward, it looks like they're sort of picking the top part of their body off of the substrate and protecting their head. Okay. But indeed, okay, this is probably an instantaneous uh, pattern associated with the death of these individuals. <clears throat> I was telling you a bit about the beach before. We know that some individuals basically did live through that original gas, ash, 
uh, deposition coming from the volcano. And because, of course, now with these great excavation techniques, they have the ash layers, and above it okay, are the uh, uh, skeletons, okay, in this case the cask, okay, of individuals who are actually in one of the pyroclastic surges. Okay. They even have individuals who seem okay, to have extended through two pyroclastic surges. Okay? And again, they can see this stratigraphically as differences between the different surges. Okay? So how they manage that, okay, or it's some kind of an effect of the depositional environment that's not really known. Okay? So it is indeed, I guess the, the impression that I want to sort of leave you with in discussing this is that it is a very complicated sequence of events, okay? And death probably, even in the same, um, even individuals who died in the same moments, okay, could have died from any combination of these things, depending on little micro environments, positions that they were actually placed, okay, within the boathouses or on the beach. So there's not one single pattern that you can apply over all of these um, individuals, okay? And here are some of the postures or poses, okay, that have been found at one of the sites within Herculaneum. So you can see, you know, basically sometimes they say these are the positions of the bodies as they were thrown, okay? This was at the moment of death, a very big rarity in terms of bioarchaeology. We don't actually have this kind of lens where we can capture that moment of death archaeologically. Uh, this is actually one of the more incinerated okay, versions of the skeletal materials, I shouldn't say incinerated, burned, okay, that indeed okay, some of the skeletal materials do show cracking and burning. Okay. Uh, they actually make the statement that because of the, the very rapid intensity of this heat as it hit the body and then it's rapid cooling, that it's only areas of the body that are not covered with a lot of soft tissue that probably were the only ones burned, okay? The back of the head, the shoulder blades, okay? The knees, things like this, whereas the thigh, okay? The torso, these kinds of things would have been more protected by soft tissue and that original kind of blast, okay? And so this is one of the views, okay? A skeleton we saw before. You see that darkened area on the back of the skull and on the scapula, very superficial kinds of bones. Also with the wrist, okay? And it may be, okay, that you know, we are really looking at that intense heat, okay, really affecting the skeleton in this way. And I should mention also, too, the dark bones, okay, the blackened bones, okay, are usually not heated to the intensity of bone that you see that actually goes gray or white, okay. So this actually, like for a crematorium, for example, would be at a low temperature, okay. It's blackened, okay. But high temperatures, okay, hitting bone are usually turning them uh, into yellows, creams, grays, whites, okay. Uh, this is, uh, I, it looks like I put this a little, <laughs> I think I put this a little out of kind of, I'm always messing around with my slides at the very mi last minute before I come in to um, talk with you. But this is actually showing you the town below the modern level of the countryside. So you can see when they talk about an excavation going deeply and the boathouses are actually lining here. So here's the wall that goes to the town. Of course, you move down here and you can see the, you can see the, the depression, essentially, of the, of the old town from the modern landscape. Okay. And this is a beautiful rendition, again, okay, of this blast, okay, killing individuals, okay, maybe debris. You can see flying statues in the air, which is a nice way of doing it here because it's not just natural things from the environment that are flying around. It's building materials, okay. And then on top of that, you can see, and this is the second reconstruction of the same place, okay, the layers of other mass, okay, of volcanic material coming from uh, one to several of these surges, okay. So having said that, holy smokes, I have to talk a whole lot about the skeletons, okay? So the archaeology of a catastrophe. <laughs> so how are the eagles doing? Somebody out there has to have the game on on their iPhone. <laughs> you don't fool me. I know you guys, especially the ones that were drunk here by their partners. <laughs> I'm no fool, okay? I was surprised anybody came today with an eagles game. <laughs> 
Listen, I'm one of these people that sits in the back of the room and I'm tapping out on my little iPhone and stuff like this. I'm like the world's worst person. Anyway, let's look at the archaeology of a catastrophe, okay? And here you go, okay? There's a lot of really cool things about catastrophe archaeology. I, um, I actually work on a catastrophic sequence, which is here at the Penn Museum. It's a collection from a, a, an Iron Age site uh, called Hassan Lu, and I've talked about that many times to members of our um, museum group. And it also, too, it's actually a sacking of the city. It's a murder of its inhabitants. That's a different type of catastrophe. But catastrophes are always a bit of a surprise, okay, in terms of population structure. And uh, just, and it's consistent, okay, across continents, across time, you know. It doesn't really matter where you are, okay. For some reason, and lots of people have gone into great sort of feats of trying to explain this, okay. Always, okay, there is a preponderance of children, many more than what actually you would think would represent like a um, census, okay, at that place at that time. And there's too many women, okay. Now, you know, and this is actually showing you the earthquake and subsequent tsunami that actually hit Indonesia in 2005, actually 2004, okay, I think the photograph was taken in 2005. And this, I mean, kind of devastation, and in terms of the numbers of individuals who were killed, basically re represents the same thing. A third of the individuals were children, and many more women than you would predict, okay, in comparison to men. Maybe the men all float away or go somewhere else or whatever happens, okay. Maybe they're zoomed up in some kind of a spacecraft or something like this. <laughs> But this forms a good frame for us in the analysis of the materials from Herculaneum. You see what I mean? Let's see if it looks like a catastrophe. Okay? Does it have that same kind of a combination? Well, indeed it does. Okay? Yeah, okay. And uh, this is not Janet Monge, like making it, wanting it to look like a catastrophe. This was actually taken from the uh, major work okay, on the site okay, by Luigi Capasso. And he actually presents okay, this in two forms, okay, as a percentage and also to his raw numbers. Okay. Almost always, we think archaeologically, we're underrepresenting the children, right? And we think that because they're sort of harder to find. Their skeletons are more fragile, so of course we don't retrieve them as often and things of this nature. So even given that kind of issue associated with archaeological occurrences, you can see that there's a lot of kids. Okay. You can also see that there is quite a great deal of women, okay. especially when you get into older age categories. Also interesting, because the fact okay, that women have a tendency to have a greater lifespan or longer lifespan than men seems to pan out. Okay. So I realize that I'm kind of going along a little long in time. So I will sort of bump through this, I hope. Uh, really quickly with you, okay, they do actually have the remains of a lot of, okay, actually infants, just born individuals up to the age of five, okay, and the preservation is actually pretty good. Even more remarkably, as I had said, they actually have preserved wood from the site. They have that kid's cradle, okay, yeah. Okay, I, I hope someday to get there and actually look at this material because it just blows my mind. Okay. They also, too, try to look at the occupations of the individuals by looking at particular ways they actually use their bones. Okay. These ways of using the bones, exceptional muscle areas that are associated with particular activities are called markers of occupational stress okay, or of occupa or occupations in general. A lot of this kind of model was based on an amazing also sequence of work which was done in the Middle East at a very famous site called Abu Herrera. And they were looking at uh, the action on the skeleton of women who spent probably something on the order of eight hours a day grinding wheat for bread. Okay. So the next time okay, you think, okay, you don't want to go home and cook dinner? Okay. <laughs> Get down 
in this position and do that for eight hours, okay? I can assure you, okay, you will be very happy, okay, to actually, at least if it's my case, make that cheese sandwich, okay, which I seem to do every night, okay? <laughs> These markers of occupational stress have been looked at in many skeletal collections. And the people who critique this, I'll tell you the critiques at the onset, the people who critique this say the following thing. In order to reconstruct life patterns based on muscle attachment areas, okay, you have to extrapolate from some known kind of a, a process. Okay? And mostly with these prehistoric peoples, we don't know okay, what those processes would have been like. Okay? Certainly, I don't think it's a big leap to see the woman in the Middle East okay, down there grinding up weed. Okay? But a lot of other activities are harder to sort of get to the core and look at the musculature. So they have indeed been super critiqued. And they've been critiqued also, too, at the site of Herculaneum. So Sarah Bissell, as well as, and I'll show you Capasso's work later on, too, we're looking at changes in the musculature of the hands and the shoulder ex associated with uh, particular kinds of activities okay, in a laborer, for example. Also, too, looking at the kinds of activities in the shoulder joint associated with women's work. Okay, in this case, obviously not high-status women, but women who are there to serve okay, those high-status women. She also, too, did reconstructions of one individual who... She actually claimed was a, a, a soldier. She did this because he was found with a sword, and I think you can see the problems if you're blowing in a boathouse. You know, anybody could have a sword associated with them. So it may not be this individual. He might not have been a soldier. But in his skeleton, he also had actually um, damage to the lower part of his leg right above the knee. But he also, too, had these really strong muscles on the inside of the thigh. They're called adductor muscles. And where you see really strong adductor muscles is in horseback riders, okay? Because, of course, I've never ridden a horse, but I assume everybody's correct when they tell me this, that you grip into the horse's side and you actually control the horse, okay, by the action of your legs, okay, by gripping into them. So that would be one of these markers of occupational stress, okay. Capasso, okay, did the same, actually, with one of the skeletons in which he looked at finger bones, okay, and came to associate the muscle bumpiness with the wearing of particular kinds of boxing gloves, okay, which were known to exist at the time that would have made this particular effect on the skeleton, assuming that the person is a life course, was operating as a boxer, okay. They also looked at these things called non-metric traits of the skeleton. I have to spend a moment and give you a bit of a background on these. These are traits that are considered to be highly heritable and actually to distinguish populations from each other. And although historically the statement is made that at Pompeii and at Herculaneum there are people coming from many different places okay, to these resort towns, Indeed, when they look at these non-metric traits, I reproduced one that actually is done on, on uh, Japanese populations. So you can distinguish within Japanese populations, okay, these heritable traits. When they did this at Pompeii and Herculaneum, guess what, okay, they looked like they were sampling one people, okay. And, but even though I say that, okay, the Pompeii and Herculaneum samples are two different people. What's the story with that, okay? So you see, okay, so it's not as you would expect, okay. They expected different peoples at each site, and instead, okay, they got two different people at the two different sites, okay. So maybe people came from Pompeii from one place, Herculaneum from another place. Maybe this is just differences in the techniques of analysis. It could be a number of things. So this is why I say we await future work, okay. We also look at the skeleton in terms of uh, features associated with health and disease. There are some wonderful kind okay, ways of doing this. The skeleton is not especially sensitive to um, uh, uh, diseases in the body. They have to be really uh, chronic ones for them in order to affect the skeleton, but we do have some indicators of these sorts of things. Okay. Uh, one of them are these lines on teeth. 
that are associated with uh, problems associated with growth and development in children. The lines on the teeth gay of this individual indicates that when that tooth was forming, actually that's a premolar tooth, probably it's forming at about six or seven years of age, that that child was challenged in some way, either through a fever or probably something much more likely like a fever associated with nutritional inadequacy, something like that. And although we do get a high incidence of hypoplasia okay, in the population at Herculaneum, okay, uh, it's called the osteological paradox, and here it goes. Okay. When you see the lines on the teeth, you know the kids were sick. Okay. But unlike in populations which are not doing so well, the sick kids die in those populations. In populations where you have the maintenance of populations, okay, through uh, some kind of an intervention technique, the kids actually live. So you see these hypoplasias, you think the kids are sick, but actually it means that the kids were sick but lived. Okay? So it's actually a positive indication, essentially, of the quality of life okay, at the time in that place. Okay? And here's a close-up, basically showing you more of these hypoplasias. You can see them, this is a scanning electron micrograph of them in much more detail, actually, too. We do know that they had a lot of cavities, by the way, that they ate uh, basically a fair, decent amount of uh, carbohydrates, probably, in their diet. Although, in terms of their, you know, sort of health of their skeleton, they are indeed in pretty good shape. Uh, that is, they wore their teeth quite heavily, and like European populations even today, there is a tendency for them to actually be more prone to cavities than populations in other places in the world. And I'll skip by that, okay, just because I saw Tina came into the room, which means I have to shut up, okay. There are heel fractures which are present, so in other words, and the heels are actually pretty good, meaning that they probably immobilize the limb and allow for healing to happen, so there was quite care, you know, which is exercise towards people who were traumatized, okay. In terms of the actual skeletal materials, this is not so much associated with health and disease, but the thinking is that a lot of the cracks that you see in the bone like this, okay, these are all on skulls, are probably associated with heat. This is actually sort of a bit of a forensic um, sideline here. There's always the statement that when a person dies in a fire, whether or not their skull bones actually explode, okay, that's associated with sort of a superheating of the brain inside of the exoskeleton of the, of the skull. Generally speaking, that doesn't happen in most kinds of fires, but in this kind of fast, almost flash heat, okay, associated with Herculaneum, indeed it does seem to be the case. In terms of other stress indicators, at the top of the eye orbit, okay, there is a, a pock marking, which is called cribra orbitalia, which is actually found in many of the people okay, from Herculaneum. This is active cribra orbitalia. This is it on a Herculaneum specimen healed. It is associated with anemia, okay, and this part of the world has a very high incidence of thalassemias, okay, which is associated with malaria, okay, which was common okay, in the southern circle Mediterranean, southern parts of Europe okay, at this time frame, so they lived. There are uh, old, lots of older women, and in fact there is a bone change which is hormonally mediated in older women, which is a thickening of the bone of the frontal part of the skull, so you're looking inside of the head, like it's almost like you were looking down like this onto the skull. That thickening is present, okay, actually in very high frequency, especially in Pompeii. So we actually have people living really, really old, okay. And again, when I talk about sort of the demographics of past populations, I always talk about them having an average age of death, which is low. But clearly, in this time frame, there is a sustained aged population. Okay? And then there's actually just two more slides, and then there's two summary slides, and then we'll sort of be finished with it. Uh, it looks as if uh, in 2010, a researcher at Herculaneum identified, okay, actually a congenital syphilis. There is a big issue about syphilis. 
whether or not it was introduced to Europe gay by Columbus gay and his men when they came back to Europe gay after being in the Americas. So was syphilis native to the Americas and brought back to Europe? If indeed, okay, this is a syphilitic change okay, at the Herculaneum, then it would sort of put that on its side, meaning that syphilis had been found long before okay, any of these voyages of exploration. We do know that some of the individuals probably had a particular kind of group of bone changes that are that is associated with and I, I always bring this one up because it's sort of super cool I bring this one up and I I was always forced to drink goat milk when I was in Italy and go I still to this day can't be around goat milk okay uh, by drinking raw goat milk okay and yeah for some reason I in the Bay of Naples and certainly on Ischia I mean it was like Go goat milk, okay? And my family, I was so upset about the goat milk milk thing that my family just resorted when beginning at the age of four. This is why my brain's not too wired too tight. I began drinking wine. <laughs> so it's the only other <laughs> beverage I could drink. <laughs> so there is actually a disease associated with drinking raw goat milk, okay? and they actually showed that game. Okay? So then the two conclusions on this game. Okay? And we've really already talked about them, okay? Non-metric data okay, seems to show that these are uniform populations in these two towns, but they're different from each other. It seems as if when we can sort of construct two different classes, okay, in the case there's one of the sites at Herculaneum where they've got two groups of people. One of them are huddled around their gold and jewelry, and the other one don't seem to have anything. Okay. So if those are two different classes, we don't really know. It could just be the selfish ones and the unselfish ones, I'm not sure. Then it appears that they all show the same general health in the skeleton to each other. Okay. They appear to actually be, because uh, uh, stature is always a good indicator of general nutrition and disease levels, they seem to be the same height as modern people from Naples, okay. and that is they're, they were short then and they're short now, basically. <laughs> so I didn't realize if I was still back in my homeland on Ishii, I'd be like a giant at five foot seven. Okay. Uh, they feel that these individuals okay, uh, uh, underwent a lot of systemic traumas and they survived, so there's adequate healing facilities and they're adequately, adequately nourished. Okay. And their lifespans okay, were close to what they are in the modern world. Okay. And if that's any indication of essentially a, a healthy, basically a good, a nourished, okay, a relatively healthy population, then they certainly fit the bill. So. I will keep quiet okay, and ask if there is, can I take a couple questions, Tina? Okay, maybe take a couple questions. Hopefully I can answer them. I'm not really sure.